Hello everybody, my name is Matt, and here we're going to be talking about how to systematically interpret a 12-lead ECG. I know that everyone has their own flow and how to actually read a 12-lead, but this is how I kind of do mine. Now you may be asking yourself, what makes me qualified to talk about this? My answer is pretty simple. I have a microphone and a lot of extra time on my hands. So now let's kind of get into the lecture. Is this you? Well, to be honest, people who went through a basic 12 week class may feel that. I mean, I used to feel like this all the time. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the medical field, you can always learn how to read squiggles on a piece of paper, because that's honestly all it is. I promise it is not rocket science. Just do any kind of systematic approach. So we see tons of 12 leads every single day, right? Every time we read one, we should be trying to learn something new from it because at the end of the day, a 12 lead does a lot more than just show a STEMI. See any kind of electrolyte imbalances, increased ICP, subtle STEMIs, PE, and so much more if you take the time to learn it on your own. So when you look at a 12 lead, maybe this is kind of what you start thinking about, right? Well, you can see here what each lead looks at. This, looks a, this is a little confusing, so luckily for you guys I have a little mnemonic. I'm not creative enough to come up with it, but here it is. The mnemonic is I see all leads, and you can add on a 12 lead at the end of it if you really want to. The I is your inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF. C is going to be your septal leads, V1, V2. A is going to be your interior leads, so 3, V4. And leads is going to be your lateral leads, so V5, V6, 1, and AVL. So when you go through any kind of 12 lead interpretation, I'm sure I've seen it a ton. I've seen, you know, physicians, paramedics, everyone kind of just quickly look at the 12 lead, and within about four seconds, they just toss it away and say it's fine. Did you really look at it all that much? No. So these are the six steps you need to kind of get into. Look at the rate. Look at, is it regular, irregular? What's going on there? What's the axis, which I know everyone just kind of, you know, has a little bit of hypertension every time you hear, oh, I have to interpret the axis, what's the point of it? Now, the next one is look at all your intervals, all right? Is there hypertrophy? And last but not least, infarction, which is probably something we don't really need to talk about, John, because it's not that hard to see. Step one, rate. This is pretty self-explanatory here. So what is the rate of the rhythm? You find a QRS that is on a line of a big box. You can see the big boxes here, 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 and here. If the next QRS complex occurs at the next big box, the rate is around 300. If it occurs two big boxes away, it's around 150, and so on and so on. You can so kind of see all these examples right here. And usually I kind of stop around 60, but you can keep going. But this is the one I kind of just go to, the 300, 150, 175, 60. And that gives you a good clue of, you know, is it fast or is it slow? And that's pretty much all you kind of do with the rate. This is called the big box method. It is a fairly easy way to actually quickly get the rate. A rate over 100 is your tachycardia. 60 to 100 is normal. Less than 60 is your bradycardia. For patients, and this is only good for regular rhythms. So if you have a patient who's irregularly irregular, like your AFib or variable conduction ratio with your uh, atrial flutter, you may need to count out the whole rhythm strip, which is usually like 10 seconds, and multiply that by the amount of QRS complexes. A little bit more math, so hope your patient isn't in AFib or atrial flutter. Next, determine if the rhythm is sinus in nature, so determine if the impulses occur from the SA node. You can do this by looking for a positive P wave in leads 1 and 2 and a negative P wave in AVR. There should be 1 to 1 ratio of P to QRSs, so for every P wave there should be one QRS complex. And then you can determine if the rhythm is regular, regularly irregular, which is like your sinus with your ectopy, so your PVCs, PACs, PJCs or your sinus arrhythmia, or irregularly irregular, so your AFib, your wandering atrial pacemaker, or your multifocal atrial tachycardia, so your WAP and your MAT. All right, guys, here's your step three. This is your hypertension, I mean, sorry, your axis. Many people glance over this and don't even look at it because they think it's so complex and hard. You can see in this picture right here of how to actually determine the axis of a 12 lead. Look at the QRS complex and you determine if it's positive or mostly positive, negative or mostly negative, or indeterminate, which is equally positive and equally negative. And you just compare it to that little graph up there. It's really not that hard, I promise, guys. The axis can point to underlying health issues. It can help you come up with a list of different differentials. And here's some examples of each. I'm not going to read through them all. I hope that if you're in medicine, you can at least read. 
So you got your left axis deviation, your right axis deviation, and your extreme axis deviation. All right, luckily for us, the extreme axis deviation is only pretty bad rhythms and messed up putting on your limb leads. Like I said before, if you can find the axis, you can, you can change your differentials, you can put things in. I, when I was going through school, my instructor always said, you get your, get your primary diagnosis and you get your differentials, right? When you start getting on axis, you can start pulling out things. So, so supposedly you're thinking, oh, maybe it's Will Parkinson White or whatever, and they had a right axis deviation. And you're like, eh, nope, can't be that actually. So you can just pull that out of bucket and it can help you come up with uh, other things that could be going on with the patient. Step four. Now that we're away from the uh, hypertensive inducing axis, we can go onto the smoother and easier concepts. The waveforms and intervals, they're pretty self-explanatory. They're pretty easy. I just put up these pictures right here. They're from Life in the Fast Lane. Awesome site, by the way. But it can just give you the millimeters and how many seconds they are and your different intervals and stuff like that. I'm not really much going to go into these all that much, but here's the thing if you guys want to pause it and look at it. So while we're going into our waveforms, going to go into first one is obviously our p wave this shows the hrr depolarizing that the amplitude is usually 0.05 to 0.25 millivolts that's usually 0.5 to 2.5 small boxes and is usually between 0.06 to 0.11 seconds and is and the duration is usually 1.5 to 2.75 small boxes and you can kind of see this picture right here on the left you got your normal your right atrial enlargement your left atrial enlargement and and you get the whole caboodle of right atrial and left atrial right there. So you can look at those, interesting, but it's not gonna really change too much about how you treat your patients, especially the emergency room. It's just something cool to know. Next we're gonna be talking about the PR interval. So obviously the PR interval is usually 0.12 to 0.20 seconds or 120 to 200 milliseconds. Elongation of this can be caused by your heart blocks, like especially like your first degree heart block, a short PR interval can be caused by some kind of pre-excitation syndrome, such as your Wolf Parkinson White or your LGL. This is the Wolf Parkinson White you can see up here on the unicorn's horn. Super professional, I know. That is the delta wave. Usually the P wave is going to be like right here. It's a short PR interval, and that shows the pre-excitation. That's your Wolf Parkinson White. On to the Q wave. Q wave is not always noted on every single 12 lead. But if it does occur, it's usually it's the, usually the first negative deflection before the R wave in the QRS complex. So you can see it right here, P, R wave going up, Q wave smack dab in between them, and there's the Q wave sandwich again right there. Not that hard. You can sometimes see them in the lateral leads, and remember when I was talking about the lateral leads, you got your 1 AVL and your V5, V6. Now Q waves are somewhat interesting. The normal Q wave is supposed to be small and narrow, there are a few Q waves that you should be aware of, and the first one is going to be your pathological Q wave, which is one small box wide or greater than 25% of the QRS complex. The newer age of electrophysiology and interpreting 12 leads is using proportions. I know, I know, math, we all hate math, no big deal. It's, you can also use some kind of visualization if you want to, or you can plug it into your calculator. It's not gonna, I mean, if you want to get more technical, you can. I do just because I'm weird and I'm nerdy like that, but you can also kind of spot it. If you see a really small QRS and a massive Q wave, that should be a big indicator of it. The next one is going to be your dagger Q waves. These are deep, narrow Q waves that can be easily greater than 25% of the QRS complex, but they differ from the pathological Q waves like you get from your STEMIs and stuff like that, and the fact that they are not wide. You can look over here in your lateral leads, you got your one AVL. But look over here in V4, V5, V6. These are deep, narrow Q waves. They are very ominous. Should kind of remind you of like Michael Myers standing behind you. This is going to be for your hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy patients or your hokum patients. Usually these are the ones that, you know, your 14 year olds that suddenly collapse and die. This is just an off topic thing. You don't actually have to know this for the interpreting of a 12 lead. But, you know, I like education. So. Usually your 12V is going to interpret this as LVH because of the high voltage and the QAs are going to be like, oh, there's going to be a lateral MI. Well, I don't think a 14-year-old is going to have an MI, but you know, it can still happen. But if you see the deep, narrow QAs, they're not wide at all. Start thinking hokum, especially with the high voltage right here. For the QT interval, this is distance from the Q wave to the end of the T wave. 
The normal QT interval is about around 400 to 450. Once again, off topic, when you start getting the wider or longer QT interval, so your 450, 460 or so, can usually be around for your STEMIs, and that's because they become wider based, fatter Q, uh, T waves, and which slightly prolongs the QT interval. But you really don't really, do, really need to remember that because at the end of the day, 500 milliseconds and above is the one you need to remember, 500 milliseconds, and you look at the QTC, which is the corrected QT interval. The reason why you look out for the 500 milliseconds on your QTC is because this kind of predisposes your patients to going into TDP or your core sides. Just remember, 500 milliseconds, start worrying about that. You know, if your patient's nauseous, maybe not give your Zofran for those patients because that can prolong your QT and stuff like that. Watch your amio that can also increase your QT interval as well. So, you know, start no, just know your medications. That's kind of what it goes to. Into the QRS complexes. The normal QRS duration is between 0 0.08 and 0 0.10 seconds. This represents the ventricles depolarizing. Some factors that can widen the QRS include the left and right bundle branch blocks. You got your accessory pathways from your Wolf Parkinson White with the bundle of Kent. You got your non-specific conduction delay. I'm sure you've seen that on the dock in the box a couple times. Your electrolyte imbalances, your drug overdoses, your like such as your TCA overdoses and stuff like that, and the pacemaker. And the T-wave. The T-wave depicts ventricular repolarization. The size of the T-wave varies based off your age, your sex, and actually where you put your... Generally, they're asymmetric in nature. The T-wave should be upright in every single lead except for AVR and V1 where it's allowed to be inverted. And here you can see all the things that can alter your T-wave. T-wave starts becoming more symmetrical, start thinking hyperacuteness, like such as your ischemia and stuff like that. That can be an early sign of a STEMI, not getting into this. We already have a video on that. But you can see all the ones over here. You got your Brugada, your cerebral T-waves, your bundle branch blocks, you know, all that kind of stuff. So like I said, not getting into that, but there's something you can keep into your pocket. Step five is your hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is just a term that basically means that the ventricles are becoming enlarged and thickened. So there's two different types. So you got your right ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular hypertrophy. First, your RVH is going to have a right axis deviation. You can see that on the bottom right. I left that there because I don't want you guys rewinding and going back to it. Like I said, axis is very important for this. You can have a dominant R wave noted in V1. So that just means that the R wave is bigger than the S wave. All that dominant means right there. And usually it's greater, greater than seven, mil, uh, seven millimeters. You're getting a dominant S wave, which means it's larger than, larger than the R wave in V5 or V6, which is greater than seven millimeters. Some additional changes with the right bundle branch block is you can get a strain pattern, which is like a slight ST depression and T wave inversions, which you can see here in this example. There are T wave inversions all the way down here and some minor depression. That's, that can be normal for your, for your RVH, especially if the patient has a right bundle branch block. Right bundle branch block can cause a little bit of depression in V1, V2, V3. That's the strain pattern for RVH. When you start getting your RVH and you get your strain pattern and a right bundle branch block and the patient's tachycardic and they're short of breath and the lung sounds are clear and their oxygen saturation is looking, you know, eh, kind of bad. Start thinking your PE, that's kind of where this has come from. Kind of forget about your S1, Q3, T3. It just, just forget it, okay? It's not as sensitive as this other kind of criteria I just named out to you. But like I said, that's just something else you can learn. If you're here just for a 12-week kind of class and not going too much in depth with it, feel free to block that out. So there is a ton of criteria for diagnosing left ventricular hypertrophy on a 12-lead. But one of the easiest ones is the sokolov lyon criteria which is the S wave depth in V1, plus the tallest R wave height in either V5 or Z6. You add them up, and if it's over 35, you got your answer of LVH. Another criteria is the Cornell criteria, which states you add the R wave in AVL to the S wave in V3. If it's over 28 millimeters in men or greater than 20 in females, you got your LVH again. Now, remembering all these kind of criteria is kind of a headache, right? We already added math before. We don't want to add more math, right? Because like I already see you guys just clicking off this video. So don't you worry. Don't you worry. No more math. If you're about to take a test or something like that on it, I don't remember the numbers or whatever your instructor says. But if you're thinking about it out in the field, here's some easier criteria. Got your high voltage. So you can see that over here. Look at those massive QRS complexes. Massive, massive, massive. And you have your strain pattern. I was talking about it with the RVH strain pattern over here. Strain pattern two as well. 
see that strain pattern with the T waves right there, right? So look for your high voltage in your strain pattern. And finally, step six, infarction. Infarction is pretty simple to see on a 12 lead, so it's so simple we shouldn't really pat ourselves on the back for seeing it. If you're interested in picking up subtle STEMIs, I do have another video on how to determine or how to see the subtle STEMI or the occlusion MIs. You guys want to check that out, but it is part of my process, so I do need to get into step six infarction. So all that means is you need one millimeter of elevation in two contiguous leads with a reciprocal depression. When I say contiguous, I mean your inferiors, two, three AVF. You can see the reciprocals, so look at all these, right? So if you have elevate one millimeter of elevation in two, three AVF, and you're, you have depression in one in AVL, you can call it a STEMI. And that's it. Congratulations. You are a 12 lead master. Just kidding. There's two more circumstances you need to remember. For an interior STEMI, which you can see over there is your going to be your V1, V2, V3, V4. You need two millimeters of ST elevation in V2 and V3 to call it a STEMI for patients older than 40 or greater than 2.5 millimeters for men less than the age of 40. And for ladies, you only need 1.5 millimeters of elevation. For posterior MIs, you look for ST depression in V1 to V4. Always remember, V2 is more sensitive, so if you see a flip T wave or some depression just in V2, start thinking about your posterior MI. Now, due to a normal 12 lead not being able to see the posterior, which is the back of the heart, how will we know if the posterior wall is infarcting? Well, look at that nifty image I have right over here. Basically move V4, V5, V6 to the patient's back. V4 becomes V7, V5 becomes V8, V6 becomes V9. Make sure you label these bovelies when they get printed, saying it's a posterior one so you're not confusing yourself if you have 6 or 7 out. And like I said before, you only need 0.5 millimeters of elevation in V7 to V9 to confirm a STEMI for the posterior lead. The reason why is because there's a lot of fat and muscle on the back and it's harder to see the posterior wall for the electrodes, so they just put it down to 0.5 millimeters. And I added this slide in here just because I like to have fun. I didn't add a lot of memes to the other ones, so here you go. Now for a little recap. Here are the six steps to do on every single 12 lead that you interpret. You look at the rate. What is the regularity of the rhythm? Axis. Look at your intervals. Is there hypertrophy and is there infarction? Not too crazy. Like I said, basic 12 lead interpretation class. Once you start getting a rhythm and you and a flow to it, you can create your own or whatever you want. You don't have to do this. This is just the way that I like doing it. I'm not perfect at all. Best advice I can suggest to people who are kind of new to it, new at 12 lead interpretations, or you've been through a class and you want to expand your knowledge a little bit, is to fully look at one. Don't give it the four to five seconds because, you know, every time I'd see that, I just feel like my blood pressure just skyrockets to hypertensive crisis levels every time I see that. So please don't do that if you love my health. You need to do your step-by-step -step approach with it. It's, you know, if you do that, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, guess what? There's your 12 lead. As time goes on, it's going to become more and more automatic and the easier it will come to you. Now remember guys, medicine's all about baby steps, so you take it one step at a time. My name's Matt, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video.